We're going to get started. Listen, so I got these couple of scriptures right here. This is Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. It says, and the devil deceived them. The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You know, I never saw this like this before, but it's the beast and the false prophet. They're going to be being tormented. But also it talks about the fact that people that receive the mark will also end up in the same place. And so really what that leads me to understand is that all people of all time that have rejected the way of Christ are going to end up in this lake of fire. But I don't think I ever noticed this before. I do believe that we can say, and the devil also that's going to be thrown into the lake of fire is going to be tormented with them day and night. And I was thinking for the first time I ever thought about that, boy, that's going to be a really bad place to be. Because not only is the devil going to have, be able to, and the demon spirits and whatnot going to be able to torment people, but the devil himself is not going to be just rolling and raining down there thinking he's the boss. He himself is going to be tormented. So he's going to be in a really bad mood. He's already in a really bad mood because he knows this is coming. Because he can read. And he's seen it. And he knows. He knows that this is the word of the Lord. And he's very, very angry. Okay, this is not my message. So let me keep going. Revelation, this is 20 verse 11. And I saw a great white throne. I want you to notice that. A great white throne. And him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was no there was found no place for them for who for the heaven and the earth can you imagine that the great white throne the face of God and from his face heaven and earth fled away can you imagine the heaven just opening up like a scroll and just moving away from the holiness and the power of the creator Verse 12, and I saw the dead. See, this is a judgment directly connected to the dead. And I want you to understand something. This is not talking about the physical dead. All human beings, unless the Lord returns or, and we're alive for the church, that group of people that will still be alive when Jesus comes back for the rapture of the church, that group of people will maybe never, they won't taste death. They'll just go straight into their glorified body. Hallelujah. Other than that, Every other human being that has ever lived will go the way of the grave. Okay, but just because you die physically does not mean you died spiritually. And what this is talking about right here is people that died spiritually. And I saw the dead, small and great. It didn't matter if they were rich or poor. It didn't matter if they were strong or weak. They stood before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. See, both believers and unbelievers are going to be judged according to their works. I'm going to get into that this morning. But what I want you to understand is this, is that even when it says that a believer is going to be judged according to his works, the idea is this, is that an evil, wicked person does evil, wicked works. A righteous person does righteous works. Amen. And so even the evil will be judged according to their works. Verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. This is what you call the great white throne judgment. <clears throat> These are just some verses that talk about the great white throne judgment. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I wanted to try to show you the difference between the fact of the great white throne judgment and the judgment seat of Christ. There's a complete difference in these two different judgments. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is the judgment seat of Christ. And before we get started in the teaching on the judgment seat of Christ, I titled this morning's message, Judgment for Believers? Question mark? Yes. And before we get into it, I want to tell you that God has a certain way that he sees humanity. He wrote it in his word. He, said, he used the prophet Isaiah, and this is what he said. Now, you got to remember, prophet Isaiah, about 700 or so B.C., before Jesus, about 700 years before Jesus, he's, right, he's using the prophet to speak to his people Israel. And his people Israel are not living in obedience to him. God has had this problem. I know I shared that recently. God has had this problem for a really long time where his people, and I've been guilty, where his people don't live in obedience to him and his word and his will for their lives. And so he uses the prophets to communicate that to us. Amen. And so in here he says, woe to those who rise early in the morning that they may run after strong drink who tarry late into the evening as wine 
inflames them. That sounds a little bit like my old life. All right. But look what it says. They have lyre. That's, that's some type of a stringed instrument, I'm pretty sure. I don't really know exactly what kind of a stringed instrument it is, but it's probably like a small harp. They have lyre and harp, tambourine and flute, and wine at their feet. That, that, that sounds kind of like stuff that still goes on today, right? Music. And while, I remember one time I was offshore, and I was trying to, this was early on in my Christianity, they had, back in the days, they had pornography, pornography everywhere. They were trying to get you to look at that kind of stuff. I was like, dude, I don't want to look at that. Do you see I got the Bible right here? Well, how about if we share this, right? He says, oh, no, man. He said, I got my own way. Wine, women, and song. That was his life. Wine, women, and song. And I want you to see that this has been the way that much of the world has lived their lives. They have lyre, they have harp, tambourine, flute, wine at their feet. Believe this. But they do not <laughs> regard the deeds of the Lord or see the work of his hands. I want you to know that sadly, it's not just the world that lives that way. Really, there's a big part, at least in the American church. And I know y'all hear me talk about this a lot, but I got to tell you that you might not be out there talking to a lot of people. I think that some of you are. Okay, but if you're talking to people that that are Christians that might even go to other churches or you have access to people that have grown up in church and maybe aren't serving the Lord. One of the things that I've noticed is, is this, if they're not living for the Lord, really the way the word of God talks about, they don't really like talking a whole lot about that. And they're not really focused on what God's doing on the earth. In other words, people are hurting. And God wants to bring healing to people that are hurting. People need physical healing. They need emotional healing. People are looking to the lyre and the harp and the tambourine and the flute and the wine and the strong drink to comfort them. And it's not comforting anybody. It's really not. No, it makes you forget about your immediate circumstance for a temporary moment. I can talk about it because I've been there. I know this to be true. I'm not making something up. People are looking and searching upon the earth for something to solace their pain, for something to quiet the storm. And it's not working for them. And what they really need is Jesus. And what God is wanting is his people. I'm talking about y'all. Right? I'm, I'm talking about me. I'm talking about y'all. I'm talking about biblical Christians. I'm talking about biblical churches that actually study the Bible. Okay, I'm not trying to act like we something that we all that. No, I'm just talking about just simply reading and studying the Bible. It's not really that that extravagant of a thing. It's just a basic thing that Christians are supposed to do. And when you read the Bible from cover to cover and you pray and you ask the Holy Spirit to have his way, he starts to open up your eyes. And you begin to see the world around you through the lens of God's word. And so sometimes when I, okay, let me give you an example. And it's okay, I'm going to say it because I don't really think these people watch. But I just happen to be at work last night. And if they do watch, it's okay too because they need to hear it. And there were at least two nurses at the very end of my shift that have both been raised in church and have served the Lord at one point in time in their life. And, and I have had individual time with each of them and that there's been times that one of them has been open and we've been able to have good conversations. And then there's been times maybe a little bit resistant, kind of feeling me out. And then there's other times that the other one was just like really kind of like completely resistant to the point where now the Lord showed me that the talking needs to stop and I need to pray. And that's what I'm doing. I'm praying. Amen. I'm, good. I'm, I'm lifting that person up in prayer. So at the end, one of them came in. I said, girl, you're such an awesome Christian because she said something in a positive manner. And, and, and at first I think she thought I was joking. I was later. I told her, no, 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 I was serious. She said, oh, I, I thought you were. I was just messing with you, whatever. But right before the other nurse left, this was what, right after I said that, one of them said to the other one, this is what she said, girl, enjoy your margarita tonight because I know that you have, now I'm just trying to make a point. Why do you want to fuss about people? Drink? I don't. You do what you want to do. Video on the video. You do what you want to do. I'm trying to make a point. This is a scripture. I didn't make this up. I did not write this. This is a prophet of God, and he's trying to tell us about a societal truth that has been taking place for years and years and years that people still continue to fall into the trap. That the world Jesus promised in this world, you will have tribulation, yeah. but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. And that people still try to find comfort from their pain 
any way that they can and through the lyre, the harp, the tambourine, the flute, the wine at their feet, but they do not regard the deeds of the Lord. They do not see the work of his hands and what it is that he is doing upon the earth. They are not cognizant of it. They're worried about their own situation and they're worried about taking care of what they think is taking care of their business. And in reality, they're causing chaos and confusion in the midst of their own lives. Now, I realize that I, by the grace of God, I have enough discernment to know that at certain times, like the talking needs to stop. I get that. But we need to understand that people are hurting out of there, out there, and that God has a plan, and they will, and he wants to use people like you in the lives of other people. Now, one thing we don't want to do is we don't want to be obnoxious. But I refuse to be apologetic for speaking the truth with a spirit of love and that that causes people not to like me anymore. Does that, does that make sense? Or I refuse if I'm being sweet and kind and being led by the Holy Spirit to my feelings might get hurt at first, but I refuse to live that way. Then whenever I walk in and if the nurse sees me, she's like, oh, Lord, I'm working with him today. I refuse to let that get me down. No, really, because my only desire for her and my only desire for you is to speak the truth of what God's word says. If I get it wrong, I'm not doing it on purpose, my friend. God is worthy. God is worthy and he's doing something on this earth and he's looking for a people that will partner with him, that will partner with him in the truth. You know, and, and I just want to say that, like, you know, as far as for intercessory prayer, I want to thank you guys. From whenever y'all come. And I keep on plugging it. And I, and I mean, it didn't say it ain't about that, sis. Come on, man. I go all the way to Baton Rouge. Thank you. But get up 20 minutes early. <laughs> but this isn't about you. <laughs> it's about all of us. <laughs> Tuesday night, Friday night, before Wednesday, before Sunday, if you can make it 10 minutes, 12 minutes, an hour and a half. I cannot tell you how important I believe us praying together corporately Amen. as a body yes. is. Listen, let me ask you a question. And this is nothing, to, well, it has something to do with my message. Whenever you walk in here, I mean, that was a great teaching that you did, Wade, about giving out of your want. You know, that? no, really, I mean, that's giving financially, and that's an important thing. I believe that with all of my heart. I mean, I haven't taught it enough in the past. But look, that whole concept is our whole walk with God. Like we, like when you walk into the house of God and you feel burdened and heavy laden, do you feel like giving? Listen, a lot of times if your heart's not in it, you don't feel like giving to the Lord. You don't feel like giving to the Lord, especially like if you feel like you're struggling in your finances. And I'm not trying to reteach his teaching on giving. I'm trying to make a point though. You don't feel like, there's been times in my life that, and I've talked to people like, how in the world am I going to give money to the church when I don't even have enough money to live on? No, it don't work that way. It's a law. It's the law of reaping and sowing. It's an act of faith to believe that if I will trust God according to what his word says, and I will give unto the Lord that he will give unto me uh, above uh, measure that I can't, he's going to open up the windows of heaven. He's going to pour me out a blessing. But listen, spiritually speaking, the same is true. Sometimes we feel heavy laden. We feel burdened. I know that all of y'all have felt that way before. Yes. I know you have. Because the enemy is no respecter of persons. He's constantly trying to burden us down with spiritual heaviness. Yeah. Every time we turn around, he is going to try to cause some type of a conflict to take place in our lives to burden us down. Yeah. Family members burden. Family members sick. Our loved ones are not doing well. Somebody gets in a wreck. Bad things happen. This person went to jail. This person's out of jail now. And oh, Lord, they're going to wreak havoc. I don't know. There's so many situations and scenarios that can take place in people's lives. And the enemy uses these things to burden us. And the next thing you know, it's like I'm tired and I'm weary. And I just can't go on. Can you imagine if we all show up to church like that every Sunday, what it's going to be like? No, really. I'm just trying to let you know. No. I'm just saying. I don't know about you, but I love the Holy Spirit movement. Uh, but, and I'm going to tell you right now, he wants to do more. I can promise you, he wants to do more. He wants to pour out his Holy Spirit. Not just in this church, he wants to pour his Holy Spirit out on this earth. I can promise you, the Lord is tired 
of his people not rising up and believing him according to his word. I can promise you the Lord wants his people to rise up and to quit believing the lies of Satan and to start believing the truth of his word and he will release the power of his Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our lives. He wants us to believe his truth. He wants to move. He wants to pour out his spirit. And so sometimes when we come together, if we're all coming together and we have this heaviness, it's hard for us to release the worship yeah. that is due to the Lord. I'm trying to communicate to you what the Lord's putting on my heart as a pastor as I pray. And one of the things that the Lord has spoken very clearly to me about regarding this church, I personally believe it's supposed to be for every church. Well, I'm not trying to be dogmatic, but I personally believe it's supposed to be for every church. But I know the Lord has showed me this for our church. What did he show you, Pastor Man? He showed me that this church is called to exalt the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. That's right. <laughs> wow. What a novel idea. He told me that this church is called to worship the King. We're going to have a worship night coming up June, June, July 29th. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't have the time yet. And it's going to be called a call to worship your king. It's going to be right here on a Saturday night. We're dimming the lights. I'm probably going to buy two more of these lamps, put them in the back, and we're going to worship Jesus. And I'm going to get some flyers made, and I'm going to give them to y'all, and y'all going to hand them out, and I'm going to put it in the newspaper, and we're going to believe God. We're going to believe God that if they got sickness in their physical body, that the Lord will heal them. We're going to believe God that if they got something they need deliverance from, that the Lord will deliver them. I'm telling you right now, we're going to go out to the highways and the byways. We don't need to seek after the Christian, but if you know Christians out there that ain't living right, hand them a card. I didn't don't tell me ain't living right. Just hand him a car saying, hey, a call to worship. See, it started off as a call to worship the king. And the Lord told me, no, you need to tell Danielle to put the personal pronoun in there. It's a call to worship your king. He's in your king this morning. Hallelujah. Because if he's your king, I'm telling you right now, he deserves worship. I don't care what you feel like when you come into the house of God. I'm here to tell you, he deserves Worship because he's worthy. He is the God of glory. He spoke the world into existence. Hallelujah. He parted the Red Sea. He scattered the stars in the sky. He breathed life into a lump of clay. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. And, we, and, and the enemy wants to weigh us down. Yes, he does. He wants to weigh us down with a spirit of heaviness. He wants you to say, look at your situation, preacher boy. Look at your situation, preacher boy. Look at your little family over here. Oh, you're going to hold on to your Jesus. You better believe it, you lying devil. I'm going to hold on to my Jesus till I, by the grace of God, till I don't have no more breath left in my lungs. I don't know what you're going to do. I hope you come with, I hope you come with me. I hope that's what I'm trying to talk about. Intercessory prayer. What do you think that I want us to do when we come together? I want us to cry out to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I want us to cry out and say, Lord, please pour out your spirit. Your people are in want. Your people are in lack. Your people need you to move. Your people need you to lift the burden off of their heart. We need you to move, Lord. We need you to send people in. We need souls that are dying and hurting to come into the house of God. And when they get here, we need your spirit to change them. We need you to move in the music ministry. Yes. You think if you came in here heavy, they're not getting heavy? Yes. Listen to me, Christian. I know what the enemy's trying to do to me. You think for one second the enemy's not trying to beat up these musicians? I don't care what they tell you. I'm telling you right now, I know for a fact the enemy's trying to beat them. <laughs> trying to get up in their head. Trying to cause confusion. Trying to beat them down. Trying to tell them that they're unworthy. Trying to make them question whether or not this stuff's even real. Trying to do all kinds of stuff yeah. on the inside of them. I'm here to tell you, you need to be praying for these musicians. Because yeah. they've been given a gift by God to lead us in worship. Hallelujah. As we exalt the King of Kings yes. and the Lord of Lords because He's worthy. Yes. So when we come together in intercessory word prayer, we're believing God to do a work in the musicians. I've been praying for the intercessors because you think that they're not going to be down. Amen. No, they are. The enemy 
wants to beat them down more than anybody. Just, no, no, you, what you doing ain't, ain't or Listen, we got to learn how to endure until the end, Christian. That's what the Word of God says. He that endures until the end. Not he that started the race off good. The tortoise beat the hare in the race because he just didn't quit. The hare do run himself ragged after just a couple or run thinking that he's got it all taken care of. You get the point. He that endures until the end. That's what intercessory prayer is about. So those of you that have made it and been making it when you can make it, five minutes, ten minutes, drop in, spend a little bit of time in prayer, drop out, no holds barred, you don't have to feel no control spirit. Please, I'm begging you. We need it. We need, and we need to pray for more intercessors. Because listen, we're just scratching the surface here. We need more. And like, okay, let me get into my message so you understand why we need more. Yes. Yeah. Let me get into my message so you can understand why we need more. Because listen, we don't want to be all the way in the world. We don't want. We want to have regard for the deeds of the Lord. We want our mind to see the work of His hand. What does that mean? When I look. And my daily life, when I'm walking around, I see the fact, I believe with all of my heart that God is working on this earth. I believe with all of my heart that God the Father is real, that he sent his son Jesus, that Jesus died on the cross, that he rose from the dead, that he prayed to the Father, and that the Father sent the Comforter, and that the Holy Spirit is here. I believe that with every heart. Yes. And I believe he's been calling people yes. to come to him for thousands of years. And I believe that you and I were born for such a time as this. Right here, yeah. right now. Yeah. Your vapor of life. Oh, what are you saying, preacher? He's coming back in five years. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is this. Even if I go to sleep in the Lord, it was just a vapor that I lived. It was a short period of time, and this goes to my message, and I want you to see that. Look at this right here. See, because sometimes the people of God, well, going backwards, let me, let me just go back to that scripture right there. I had a little illustration. I might have shared this with y'all. Whenever we went to go pray, uh, it was me, Wade, Brendan, and Rob. We went to go pray for somebody that Wade knew from his past. He had gotten sick with cancer. We went to go pray healing over this guy. And, uh, Peak Roofing, shout out to Peak Roofing. They were kind enough to take us to supper that night. And we ended up going to a really, uh, I mean, I, I consider it to be a nice steakhouse. It's called Fleming's. And so anyway, we were sitting in Fleming's and the way that our seating arrangement was, I think it was Wade was on my left. I was in, kind of in the middle. Brendan was right here by me and then Robert was on the outside. And when we had walked in through the parking lot, this is just an illustration of what happened that night because it goes along with my message. When we were walking through the parking lot, we started noticing some cars in the parking lot that weren't the kind of cars that you would typically see riding around Morgan City. I don't remember what all they had. They might have had a Maserati. I don't remember. I'm not that into cars. But the point is, you could see, we're like, wow, that's like, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> so then we walk in, and so you know they got some people in here that, like some people, they some big ballers. You know, they, got, they got some big accounts, and they like moving and shaking out there in the world, right? They moving it. All right, and so we go in there, we're sitting down, and then all of a sudden, me and Wade looked at each other, and I, I was thinking the same thing, and Wade said, look at this, too. Look how sad it is. I mean, the steak was awesome. The appetizers were awesome. The dessert was awesome. I enjoyed every little bit of that. But, but in spite of that, something happened, because we were looking around, and it was like a little guy playing the piano. And everybody was like sitting there and they were smiling with their drinks. And it was like all of a sudden the way he said, look how sad that is. Mm -hmm. they, they all think that they found the answer. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I heard Brennan say something to Robert. And there's no way Brennan and Robert knew what Wade and I were talking about <laughs> because of the way the arrangement was. They were talking about the very same thing. Mm -hmm. That they were looking around at the situation. And it had burdened our hearts at the same time to see. And this is the condition of the world. Everybody's trying to get to where these people were. I mean, to some extent, they didn't all really have money. Some of them just pretended. Some of them just playing, you know. But some of them in there really have. And everybody 
is trying. You ever been to a party like that, like or a wedding reception, and you can kind. Of, I'm telling you, I've been. I've been, and I can like, okay, he's got it, he's got it, well, they want to have it. <laughs> you can pick them up. This one's really got the money in the account, this one here is playing and he wants the money. <laughs> but what they're all striving to get towards, if they ever get there, it's going to leave them empty. <laughs> they're, they're striving and they're looking for something that's going to leave them empty when it's all said and done. And that's what the world's looking for. And what I'm trying to tell you is this, is that God's got a plan on the earth. Amen. And he wants to use his people in that. And so here's another another scripture that I that God used Isaiah to say. The Lord said, because this people draw near me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. A commandment taught by men. This is boring. Like, when it, like whenever the word of God is not really in your heart. When the word of God has not really had its way in your heart. It's just a man talking. It's not even real. No, we should be fearful. Yes. We should be fearful. Listen to me. We're not just talking about reverence here. We should tremble. You don't, you don't like that? I'm, I'm trying to tell you that judgment is going to be fine. I'm not trying to talk to you about the great white throne judgment this morning because I don't believe that you're unsaved. At least I hope not. <laughs> I do believe that the enemy is, is a master at deceiving people. But what I'm trying to tell you is even if you just stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and I'm going to show you some scripture before it's over with, when we get there, it's final. Unless the Lord grabs a hold of your hand and pulls you back and gives you another chance, it's final. That's it. He's about to count it up. The accounting now will take place. The rewards will be distributed at this point in time. There's no going backwards. The, the all time for moving forward is over. I'm here to tell you this this morning because I'm here to help you because I want to be a good pastor because I want to tell you what the word of God said because I want to leave the ball in your court. I want to leave you with the empower you with the word of God and let the Holy Spirit move on your heart to give you the opportunity to make a decision today while there's still is a today of what you will do with the rest of the yeah. time that you've been given by God. All right. That's right. Hallelujah. That's but the cares of life, they distract us, right? Concerns in the world today. Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. Times have changed and so many believers are not in the word. Does it seem like I'm angry at the church? I don't want to be angry at the church. I'm trying to make a point. Are you out there talking to, to people that say they love Jesus like I am? You, if you're, maybe you're talking to some different Christians. Every now and then I do, I run across a Christian that really knows the Word of God. And I'm like, wow, praise God, this believer is really in the Word. And then the more I talk to them, I'm like, wow, praise God, this person really loves the Lord. Hallelujah! And immediately, even though they don't go to church when we do, we're having church. We're like, you're really having church. It's like we're just exchanging, we're in communion, you know what I'm talking about? And then I'll talk to other people, and it's like, dude, you're so boring. Like, all you want to do is talk about the Bible. Boring! Like, that's what I feel like. I'm like, man, I'm like an old grandpa. Like, what, like, you're so irrelevant. You know, like, nobody even cares about the word of God. What is going on? The word, the church is, a, is, a, is in a mess. People aren't even worried about the word of God. They're not in the word and not being in the word and learning how to trust God. You know what it does? It causes people to resort to what the world trusts in. Say that again. When people aren't in the word of God, Learning how to trust in God, it causes them to resort to what the world trusts in. When God's people get entangled in the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, it robs them of time that could have been devoted to God. Let me say that again. When people get caught up in the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, you know what it does? Or get caught up in sin. Let me say that again. When the people of God get caught up in sin, and find themselves in bondage to sin, get caught up in the cares of the world, get caught up in the deceitfulness of riches, it robs them of time. And the palmer worm, and the canker worm, and the locust, just eating away, eating away at time, eating away at opportunity, 
eating away at that moment that you had, that part of your vapor, to pour yourself out. I know that this sounds a lot like the drink offering message from last week. To pour yourself out, to lay it all down for the Lord. Hallelujah. It wasn't just the Apostle Paul's job to do that. I mean, listen, you're not all called to do it exactly the way I'm going to do it, but he's going to speak something to you, and he's asking you for the thing that he speaks to you to give everything to the Lord and what it is that he's calling you to do. Does that make sense? Yes. I'm not expecting you to do my job, but you have a job to do. And if you run off and do your thing by yourself, and you run off and do your thing by yourself, and you run off and do your thing, and then we're all just little individuals running around. We got an arm flopping over here. We got a finger doing this. We got a toe doing this. And everybody's just discombobulated and in the midst of division that we're not operating as a body. We're not operating in unity. No, you know what he wants to do? He wants to gift one to get the healing. He wants to, or, okay, he wants to gift us all to get the healing. He wants to gift us all with prophetic utterances. He wants to gift us all with the zeal of the evangelist. He wants to gift us all with the anointing of the prophet. He wants us to have the prophet in the prophet's mouth. He wants us all to be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. And then guess what he wants us to do? He wants us to come together and to believe God together and as individuals to operate. Even He's going to send us out, but we're operating collectively. As part of the greater whole of the body of Christ, Amen. but also locally, as a local body of Christ. And there's power when we come together Amen. and we let us unify. We let him unify us. In his Amen. 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 There's many in the church living their lives exactly like the world, acting like there's no tomorrow, focused on what they think. Make self happier. What seems to be the most important at the time. But it's momentary. There's a little regard for God. The things of God. Or the things that God's done for them. I don't know about you. But I'm talking to myself right now. Listen. God has done great things for me. And sometimes I just don't feel like I'm thankful enough. I mean I'm not trying to live in condemnation and guilt. I'm just trying to say sometimes when I get in the presence of the Lord. I'm thinking God you did so You've been so good, so gracious, so merciful. How can a man repay you? You know? What can I do for you, Lord? And you can't repay me, son. But just as I lay down my life for you, I'm asking you to lay down your life. That's the Bible, my friend. Just as I lay my life down for you, I'm asking you to lay your life down for me. So that I can live through you. That's the word of the Lord. Crucify my flesh, Lord. Teach me your ways, Lord. Form me into the image of my glorious Savior. You're the potter, I'm the clay. Oh, hallelujah. Let the word be your hands. I was praying that earlier this morning. Let your word be their hands and let the water be the spirit. And I just want to put, put myself on the wheel, on the potter's wheel. And have your way. Form me. Now, when you pray that prayer, don't get surprised. <laughs> don't get surprised when trials come and frustrations come, right? Because he's going to work stuff out in you, Christian. Do you understand that Christianity, it doesn't just happen overnight? I want you to know that. Growth in Christ doesn't happen overnight. So don't let the devil lie to you. If you are truly a born-again Christian tonight, you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you, and you find yourself struggling, and you find yourself in situations and circumstances, can I just tell you a little newsflash? It takes time to grow in Christ. But if you're not in the Word of God, and you're not allowing yourself to be planted in the house of God, where the Holy Spirit can move in your heart and in your life, it's very difficult to grow. Like a plant that you keep uprooting and sticking somewhere else, it's gonna, its growth is going to be stunted. The Lord wants us in the house of God. And I mean, I don't mean this to be ugly, really. I mean, I hope that you like our church or, you know, people that visit the church. I want everybody to like our church. But if you don't like our church for some reason, and that's one of the reasons you don't come to church, you should find a church that you think you like because you're supposed to be in church. Amen. You just need to find a church where they're preaching the truth that's right. and where they want the Holy Spirit to move. And that they're not just doing some kind of social gathering thing and they're playing church. Because there's churches out there a dime a dozen doing that. All right. So they're out there and, you know, God has done great things for them like he's done for me. And I've noticed that approaching them, 
I was telling y'all this a little bit earlier, that when I approach them with the Lord, it produces irritation. And if there's not overt irritation, then there is no spark for the things of God. They say they love him, but it seems they are just giving lip service to God and that their hearts are far from him. God sees that. I want you to know that God sees that. And I don't mean, because listen, God can turn it around. Even for those two girls, God can turn it around. I hope God do watch one day. Because God can turn it around for you. Because I've been there before and he's turned it around for me. You've been there before and he's turned it around for you. Amen. And, and but, but yet at the same time, I know for a fact that there's times. Whenever you sit there and you try to minister to people or you try to share a little bit, oh, here he goes again. Irritation. I can see it all over the face. Like, you ever talk to somebody before? Like, if I was talking to a man and, and a man is like, let me look at your corner. <laughs> I'm really either that boring or, dude, it's just time to shut up. I know, but some of y'all say, yeah, the anointing wasn't there. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. Too. Okay, maybe. Maybe so. But maybe they just dead to the Lord. Yeah. Maybe they don't want to be told That's right. that, they, that, that something's going on in their life And they need to get right Maybe it's bringing conviction And they don't want to be convicted To the point of repentance yet. Maybe they like where they're living Right then and there Until it has its way in their life And brings them to a place of desperation While they'll cry out to the Lord Maybe when they get to that place They'll remember the word that was spoken yeah. And maybe they'll cry yeah. to the Amen Jesus said this in Luke 12 and 33 through 35, I'm just going to kind of read it. He said, sell what you have, give alms. In other words, sell what you have and give it to the poor. Provide yourselves bags, a depository, something that you would store stuff in, which wax not old. A treasure in the heavens that fails not, where no thief approaches, where raw moth doesn't corrupt. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. Jesus said, lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. He said it in Matthew, where rust doesn't corrupt, where moth doesn't corrupt. Have you ever had a moth before? <coughs> Have, I mean, look, there's been times I bought some pretty nice clothes. I'm just being real with you. One time there was a moth in my closet. <laughs> and I didn't know that the moth was there. One day I thought I saw something fluttering. But then you go try to find a moth up in a big old closet after it. And then one day I pulled his shirt out. That was a nice shirt. Yeah. Little bitty holes. And I love that shirt. <laughs> and the shirt was ruined. And I tried to find the moth, and I couldn't find the moth. And I'm like, dude, I hate the way moth balls smell. It's like, I got to do something to this moth. The point that I'm trying to make is, is that so often times we're living our life and we're trying to find all these treasures and we're laying up for ourselves treasures on earth and hopefully it's not, you're not so into shirts that you would have such a connection fit over that. But you get the point that I'm trying to make. We're trying to build our lives around all of these things and they're going to be eaten up. The earth is going to be destroyed. But the Lord is telling us that the things of this life do not matter like that. The things that matter that you and I have an awesome opportunity opportunity to partner with God to do the work of the kingdom and an opportunity to lay out for ourselves treasures in heaven where moth does not corrupt. Where your heart is, where, right? Where your treasure is, your heart will be awesome. You know, I was thinking about getting a little light with a little towel. To, remember how I told y'all about girding your loins up and how they would wear it was almost like the men would wear the long kind of flowing things. Almost looks like a women's dress today. I mean, that's the clothing that they would wear. And what it meant to gird the loins up was that they'd have a belt and that they would take the backside of that thing and that garment and they'd tuck it up in their belt and they'd cinch it up like that. And that was like when they were prepared to get to moving, like it was time to travel. And the Lord said, he said, gird your loins and have your lamps burning bright. See, they just think I'm weird in the hospital right now. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be kind of weird, dude? You like gird your loins up, you got a light, you're running through there, and you start to strip. Dude, I'm telling you right now, I was in the mall, I was in a nurse practitioner conference the other day, and I literally thought for a second that I was about to stand up in one of those conference rooms and just start. Then I was like, Lord, I just got no issue. I got no issue. Because listen, there's 300 people in that room that don't know Jesus. Come on. Maybe five of them. Do I really care that much if they think I'm crazy? You know what I mean? I didn't do it, so I'm not going to sit here and pray it. But I saw a video the other day where a dude did it in a mall. And run, bro, he had their attention. He probably just got out of jail. <laughs> he was like, I don't know. Hallelujah, I'm going to do something with Jesus right here. 
I wish I would have been in there and stood up with him. Thank you, Jesus. Anyway. Paul said to Timothy, I read it to you last week, for I'm already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do you love the appearing of the Lord or the thought that the Lord's going to show up one day? The only reason I ask you that is because there was many times as an early Christian, I was just thinking when I first got saved, oh, no, I got to get married first. Yeah. And then one time, I got to have children. And then, they, oh, no, 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 no. Wait a little bit longer, Lord. I need some grandkids. Oh, no, I, I, I'm going to build me a nicer house. What I'm trying to say is that there's always going to be something that you're going to, that this, and, and, but whenever we truly get connected to the Lord, we have a desire. Because, see, his appearing coming is directly connected to the glory of his presence on the earth. His appearing coming is directly connected to him regaining his rightful place on this earth because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And the enemy has, since Adam, tried, well, even before Adam, tried to usurp the authority of God and take away from God his authority, take away from God his glory. That's what the enemy is trying to do. But do you understand when the Lord comes back, he is going to rule and reign from David's throne on the new heaven and the new earth and the atmosphere is going to be completely changed and the glory of the Lord is going to fill the atmosphere. Oh, hallelujah. I Listen, I was at the Two nights ago, I was working the last two days, so I seem delirious and tired. I walked into a room, and I was a little bit irritated because I walk into the hospital, and the doctor's already gone. <laughs> so they asked me to start seeing some of his patients, and I got all these patients. Anyway, I'm not going to tell you what I'm talking So I said, you know what? Absolutely. Let me do this. I first asked the nurse, do I look like a superhero to you? And then it was a joke. She said, absolutely. So anyway, so I go and I see this one person that has a, uh, that I had to do this little split thing and charge him up, get him out. And another late, older lady that had a laceration on her nose. And so I go into the room and I'm about to sew her nose up, whatever. And then all of a sudden I said something. Well, she said something, maybe something about bless his name or something. I'm like, hallelujah, sis. And I, I'm like, all I got to bless his name. Oh, hallelujah, sis. Right? And I'm, like, I'm a pastor of a church. Her sister and her daughter's like, really? Praise God. And so, you know, we're just sitting out. We have a church. I'm sewing up her nose and we have a church. And I'm like, look, the Holy Spirit's been moving in my life, moving in the church. Praise God. And, I, and you know, we're like, we start praying healing. We start, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And, and I told her about the worship night, and her daughter said, well, I won't be here. I'll be doing a nursing job in South. And she said, well, I'll be here. And she said, I'll come over there with my oxygen. I won't put it. Hallelujah. I'm tearing the praise of my head. Gave me a little website thing. But you know what? Before I leave, she said, I got to tell you something. Preacher, before you leave. I said, well, what you got? Said, she, said, I, she said, I was there. I was like, what you talking about? She said, I died. I was there. She said, it was just for a split second. And she said, all I can tell you, and I don't even know how to describe the love. All I experienced was the purest of love. Lord. It was in me. It was folded up. I, it's, she just said, love. Amen. I was like, wow. And when she said it, dude, she meant it. She had power from heaven. What a blessing for me, right? I think I'm going to be a blessing. All right, so it knows that. Give her, some, give her the word. Oh, man, she blessed me. Dude, because when she said it, I could feel it. So I wanted to share that with you. The Lord just dropped that in my spirit to tell you there's something waiting on the other side. I hasn't seen it. Ear hasn't heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for those that love Him. There's some waiting on the other side, church. This is nothing but a little play rehearsal right here that we live in. Hallelujah. This cares for the true Christian too, right? I can't stress enough the importance of us living for the Lord, raising our children to know Jesus, training them to serve Him. And how do we balance all this? 
I mean, being a witness to the laws, right? Because a lot of you guys in here are witnessing to people outside. How do we balance it? Being a witness to the laws, faithful to the church, because the word of God says not to forsake the gathering of the brethren, so we can function as the body of Christ. No, I mean, a real church, according, according to what the scriptures said. Listen, there was a group of people from our church that prayed with one of our brothers in the, in the church. There, there's, there's people in our church that are about to go minister in, in a nursing home. There's people in our church that have gone to the prison and ministered. Look, I, I'm just being real with you. See, to me, that, that's, that's church. I'm not trying to say that there's not other churches. I'm not even trying to brag about it. I'm just trying to say, when I read the book of Acts, I see people coming together and then going out. And they're going out under the authority of the Holy Spirit. And they're preaching Jesus. Hallelujah. And they're seeing the sick healed. And they're seeing signs and wonders take place. Hallelujah. But souls are being saved. And if nothing else, the seed of the gospel is being spread. Other seeds are being watered. And people's lives are being changed. Yeah. That is a yeah. biblical church. That's right. And as intercessors, when we come together, we cry out that the Holy Spirit would show up to give us the power that we need to do that. Yeah. And as intercessors, when we come together, we pray that the Lord will send more intercessors so that more intercessors will come together. So that we'll ask God to send more power so that he'll send more people out so that he'll do more work in the kingdom of God. Yeah. 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 Hallelujah. Yeah. That's revival. Hallelujah. Yeah. That is revival. You can ask, I mean, Shane, Shane read some of them books. I read some of them books. Living in Raven Hill, The Great Awakening, John Wesley, my act stuff started. Jesus. You know what Jesus said before he performed the miracle and called Lazarus out the tomb? My father, I thank you that you have heard me. Yeah. You think he didn't pray him four days prior? No. Jesus was a man of prayer. Elijah was a man of prayer. It is contention upon the people of God to pray. And after they got done praying, pray more. Pray at all times. Intercede and seek the face of God. We need to wake up and pray. We need to go to sleep and pray. We need to keep on praying. Hallelujah. Can't pray enough. Can't give enough. Can't pray enough. Can't witness enough. Oh, Lord, help us. The time is short. Yes. How do we do all these things? We pray. I mean, how am I going to juggle being a good mom, good dad, good pastor, good this, good that? Pray. Be led by the Spirit. Sometimes you can't make it to intercessory prayer. Okay. You got a life to live. But we ought to be trying harder. Is that true or no? Yes. Of course it is. We should be trying harder in everything that we do for Jesus. And if that's irritating you, then you got a thorn in your flesh. That's just the truth of the gospel right there, my friend. You just read it, you'll see it. You might not like the way I say it. Pray about that. <laughs> Pray about that. I don't like the way my preacher says stuff. Okay. Hallelujah. We we got other preachers that we let preach. <laughs> How do we do that? We look for him. Cry out because we pray. Amen. Whenever people uh, whenever people uh, in the balance, trying to balance all of these things. I had a, uh, I had a thought. I don't know. I might have just erased it. Maybe the Lord, if He disappeared it off of my a page, I mean, I can remember it. I got it in my heart. I'm just trying to see if He actually erased it off my page. I don't want to say. <laughs> and I was just thinking though, really about. We got all these things going on in our life, and I just. Whenever we do stand before the judgment seat of Christ, I haven't even got to the scriptures yet to talk about the judgment seat of Christ. When we do get before the judgment seat of Christ and the days there and the tally is up and he's counting and everything up and he's distributing the reward. How you reckon it would sound that, you know, when we just missed a bunch of church or we missed some things because football practice. You know, and I'm not trying to say that in such a way to irritate because I look at somebody like 
I mean, I don't know whether you, what you think about Tim Tebow, but I'm just impressed with that dude. I don't, I'm sure he's got his own little things that he's dealt with. But, you know, that, that, that dude's mama raised him. She homeschooled him. And that dude's mama went to the school district in Florida and said, oh, no, my boy Timmy's going to play. Now, his parents were Filipino missionaries. He was born in the Philippines, if I'm not mistaken. Or maybe they flew over YCB and you know, something like that. And his mama went to the school board and said, oh, no, y'all want to create a curriculum to where y'all let my boy Timmy play football. And I'm going to homeschool him. And I'm going to train him up in the ways of the Lord. I mean, he didn't want high the trophy. He won two national championships. Whether you think he was a good pro or not is another story. He's lived his life in the Lord. He continues to talk about Jesus. Okay, and hallelujah. I'm saying that there is a way that it can be done. I'm not trying to denigrate football, but football is silliness compared to the things of God. Right? And I understand that there's things that we're involved in, and God can use those things. But I'm trying to say we have to be able to, to, to make sure that we're properly, you know, we're allowing the Lord to have his way. Amen? We're going to be judged on our works. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul said this, so whether we are at home, we talk about his glorified body, one day we're going to go to be with the Lord. Amen? He says whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Each and every one of us, I need you to know this, as a pastor, I think it's important that I tell you this, each and every one of us are going to stand one day before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to give an account for what we did while we were in this body. i got to keep help us remember this. It's going to happen. We're going to stand before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one who loved us enough to die for our sin. And, and our works are going to be judged. I, I didn't put the scriptures in here, but you remember the parable of the talents, right? One got three, one got five, one got one. The one that had three turned it into six, the one that had five turned it into ten, the one that had one dug it and buried it in the ground. He said, you wicked, unfaithful servant. You could have, you could have done something with that, but you didn't. I don't know about you, but I do not God is a God of restoration, my friend. Even though, listen, when I tell you that time is lost, when I tell you the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust eats, I'm talking to you about my own life. I'm not picking on your life. I'm telling you God is a God of restoration. We've got to stop now. We've got to wake up. We've got to fall on our knees. We've got to lift up our hands. And we've got to cry out to God. We've got to say, start now, Lord. Start now. Do something to me now. Use me now, Lord. Amen. We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. This is another scripture, 1 Corinthians 3, 5 through 6. Apostle Paul says this. Who then is Paul? Y'all remember whenever we taught on the Corinthian church and we talked about the fact that they were carnal. Paul called them carnal. This is, this is coming off of that. He says, who then is Paul? Because you remember when I said, I love Paul. I love Cephas. I love Apollos. He said, who's Paul? Who's Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe. Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Yeah. So then neither is he that plants anything. You know, this is important for me to share this with you too. I've been saying it, but I'm going to keep saying it. I have noticed that there's been a couple of times, listen, maybe I'm too aware of things. I don't even know when it's sometimes whether it's the discernment of the Holy Spirit or whether it's just me being hyper aware but sometimes there's been about five different things that have happened in the church over the last nine months. And I've had four to five people come up and they, and they didn't say it exactly like this, but it's kind of like you saw what happened after I showed up. Huh? Like I'm talking about after I laid my hand on that, you saw that? They didn't say it exactly like that, but all they got to say is a little something. And it shows you the mindset. All I'm trying to tell you is this. God don't like that. <laughs> and, if he's, and listen, he'll still use you. The Bible says, I want to tell you about what the Bible says, you, might, you, you are not to think more highly of Amen. yourself than what you ought. Amen. This is what the Word of God says. He was a meek and lowly lamb. Like a lamb led to the slaughter, he openeth not his mouth. Meek and lowly. Yet such great power within him that he says, 
I am. Boom! They all fall to the ground. Lord. And he's about to lie. No man takes my life, he said. I willingly lay it down that I might pick it up again. This commandment my father gave unto yeah. me. Yeah. Great power in his meekness. He says the meek shall inherit the earth. That's all I'm trying to say. And I'm not saying this for any specific person. I have had multiple people that I've seen it show up in. And it's probably in me. <laughs> so pray for me. Because I don't want it in me. We all got a tendency to think that we, you know, Brother Lauren used to say, God's handyman for the hour. <laughs> oh, I'm God's handyman. Lord, you're a handyman for the hour. It showed up. <laughs> yeah. Lord help. Yes. So then neither is he that plants anything, neither he that waters is anything, but God that gives. Everything that we do, every gift that we've been given, every time we pray for somebody, every time we believe God for a miracle, every time a miracle shows up, it's for one thing and one thing only, to give him glory, to give him praise, to exalt the name of Jesus, that he might be magnified. Hallelujah. Glory. Now he that plants and he that waters are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. You are God's building. You know what a hu husbandry means? It means a field or a vineyard. God, Paul's saying you're like a field. You belong to God. And he's saying that we're working together. We'll get into this verse in a second. We're working together with God. The leaders are working together with God, but we're all working together as one another. You're like a crop, my friend. And the fruit of God is rising up out of the ground of the field that he has planted you in. And he wants to produce fruit in your life. And he wants to take that fruit. And he wants other people to partake of that fruit so that they themselves also. You're the building of God. Peter said that he was the lively stone and that from him we become living stones and that he's using us as living stones to build a house that would inhabit the praises of his presence. Yes. See, he wants to build us up so that he can put his presence on the inside of us so that he can be us. Amen? Amen. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds thereon, but let every man take heed how he builds thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. See, he's talking about different kinds of material, right? Wood, look, wood is going to burn up. Hay is going to burn up. Stubble is going to burn up. Precious stones, gold, silver, if it gets hot enough, it'll even burn up. Something's going to take a little bit longer to burn it up, right? <clears throat> but every man's work shall be made manifest. There's coming a day when we're going to stand before the Lord and our work is going to be judged. There's so I could write a book about the judgment seat of Christ. I'm telling you right now, I could easily write a book about it. There's so much information. Sometimes our motives aren't even right whenever we're doing the work of the Lord. We've got to make sure everybody knows what we do. We've got to make sure my right hand knows what my left hand did. Right. Hey, did you know that? Did you see what I just did? Or did you know that I did this? And we want recognition for what it is that we're doing for the Lord. And we're not supposed to be trying to get recognition. And it's kind of like sometimes I'm thinking, not, not that Shelby's ever done this, but the next time somebody tells me, and it's not true. Listen. I get excited. I hope you understand that when I'm telling you that I talk to somebody about Jesus, that I'm not trying to brag on what I'm doing. I hope you understand that I am excited. And when you tell me some of the things that the Lord's doing in you, I get excited. There's a difference between a testimony when sometimes you can discern in the spirit that people want recognition for what they're doing. Does that make sense what I'm trying to say? That's what the Lord's talking about. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Sometimes you're not supposed to broadcast what you've done. I'm thinking that, well, I'm not going to really do it, but I thought one time, like, Shelby's never done it, but if you just act like you just told me, like you just did something, I'll be like, all right, brother, boom, there's your reward right there. Boom! You got your reward. That's what the Bible said. Yeah. Atta boy, you yeah. just did it. You got it. And in other words, there ain't no reward for you. So sometimes we're doing things 
And we want recognition on earth. And the Lord's like, no, if your heart's right, you're going to do it for me to exalt me. And you're going to get your reward later. Hallelujah. That's a beautiful thing. Amen. And then he goes on to say this. If any man's work abides, which he has built thereupon, he will receive a reward. Some people's work is going uh, to abide and you're going to receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Look, this is, this is, uh, this is the NIV version. You know why? Because I scoured all the translations to find out what the original meaning in the Greek was closest to, and it came, the NIV was the closest. You ready? Here it goes, right here. If a man's work was not found to, to abide, if it is burned up, he will suffer a loss. Let me say this again. We might get before the judgment seat of Christ. It's time for reward. And he's still pulling out the rewards. Come to find out you didn't really do, which, do it the way you thought you did it. Like you thought you were doing it for the word, but you were deceived. Do you, do you know that believers can be deceived? Yes. yes. And that they're over there and they're thinking that they're doing all this wonderful stuff for the Lord. And in reality, their spirit went right about them. Yeah. And their motivation was to be recognized by men. Do you know how many scriptures there are in the Bible that warn us not to be doing things to be recognized by men? There's a whole bunch of it. Yes, sir. That's what the Pharisees did. They wanted to sit in the seat of Moses. They had long and flowing robes. They had phylacteries on their head. And they wanted to be called great teachers. Because men love the praise of men. But he said right here, if it's burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Wow. <laughs> That's what it said. That's the NIV because it's the closest to the Greek. <laughs> he himself, if it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved. But only as one escaping through the flame. What is he going to lose? He's going to lose his reward. Every reward that was done from an improper motive will be lost. I'm a good pastor for telling you this this morning. I'm trying to prepare your heart. I'm trying to preach to myself that I keep my own heart right. That I keep my own life circumspect before the Lord. I want, Lord, I don't want to live my heart. Can you imagine that? I sent out a video to group text. Did any of y'all watch that video? That one about the actual great white throne judgment where they went before the Lord. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That video. Listen, there was a, I know, there was little things and nuances in there that weren't right. I get that. But dude, I'm talking about the finality of it all. Dude. Huh? Whenever it's like, no, you thought you were doing all this stuff for the Lord? Did, you, did I send that to you? I meant to if I did. You, when you thought that you were doing all, only because you had sent me them other ones. I'm hell on this stuff. You thought you had done all this stuff for the Lord, and then, like, there's no more talk. It's like, well, no, that's what they were doing. Like, no, Lord, I, 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 no, no, you didn't. But even with this, it's even more, like, possible for Christians. You're not going to lose your soul, but you thought you were doing all this stuff for the Lord. Yeah, how many pastors are going to stand before the Lord, and this is going to happen to them? And they literally thought that they were doing what was right because they were following a trail of pastors that went before them. And I know what I'm talking about because I, I've witnessed it. Amen. The good old boy network is what I used to call it. Atta boy, you're doing a good job for your people. Not even telling them the truth. Not even telling them things like this. Lord, help. Help your people. Help the pastor. Help the preachers <laughs> to wake up. I don't want to. Do you want to stand before the Lord and hear that? No. Anyway, all right. Maybe I'm getting too much. I want to. I want to share a little bit with you. I'm going to go ahead and go to the Word of God because you know last week we talked about the spirit of Jezebel, and um, what, what was that? Was Wednesday, right? First Kings. And I, I, obviously, I don't have time. I need to be closing this message up. I appreciate y'all's patience. We're about to close. Talked about the spirit of Jezebel. I talked about uh, the, the overarching spirit of Jezebel, how 
the spirit of Jezebel has been around before the literal Jezebel and not how the spirit of Jezebel wants to usurp the authority of God and that that's just an attribute of the way the enemy works through seduction and lies. You know, the spirit of Jezebel, you could say, is behind the fact that because you're in pain with something, because something tragic happened to you, that you need this in order to get through. But this that you're getting through with isn't Jesus. It's something else that the world is offering. That's the spirit of seduction that's lying to you. That's a spirit of deception. That is not the truth of God's word. It's a lie. And if you believe it, now you embrace it. It could literally lead you down a road where you do not do the things that you're supposed to be doing for God because you're not even here for God. So the spirit of Jezebel can work in many ways. It's an attribute of the evil one, right? But we're talking about the literal Jezebel. One of the things that I wanted to share with you last week, and I did, but it goes along with my message. Look at this story right here. Okay, this is towards the end of Jezebel's life, kind of. And it came to pass after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, he had a vineyard. See, I just talked to you about vineyards and fields, right? That's scripture in Corinthians. He had a vineyard which was in Jezreel that was hard or close by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke to Naboth saying, give me your vineyard. So just think about this. Give me your fruit, man. I'm the king. I'm married to Jezebel. I got influence. I'm a king. Give me your fruit, man. Right? And he says, now that don't, that don't sound like the devil to you. All right? That, that, that don't sound like the serpent in the garden to you. That I may have it for a garden of herbs because it's near my house and I will give you something better. I'm going to give you something better. That, that lying devil been trying to tell people for so long, he's going to give them something better than what they already have from God. He is a liar. Come on. He said, I'm going to give you something better than it. Or if it seems good to you, then I'll just give you the money. This reminds me of the king's valley. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of peace, and king Barah of Sodom. And I done, Sodom, I done told y'all, y'all can't make this stuff up. Barah's name means evil one. He's the king of Sodom. Melchizedek is the king of Salem, the king of peace. His name, Melk, means king. Z Zedek means righteousness. He is the king of righteousness. He rules over the province of peace. And he is meeting a believer, Abraham, in a valley called the King's Valley. And Bera is the evil one. You can't make this stuff up. This is Old Testament stuff 2,000 years before. This is 700 years before or 500 years before right here. You can't wait. I haven't even told you all the name what Naboth means. Just hold on. He wants his vineyard. Naboth says to Ahab, the Lord forbid it me. That I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. The Lord saying to you, Christian, the Lord forbid it to me. That I would let you, you lying serpent, you stinking lying devil, that I'm going to give to you the inheritance given to me by my father. No, I'm not going to give you my inheritance. It's because you ain't got nothing better for me. You ain't got nothing but a lie. Amen. A lie to hold me in bondage. Trying to steal my fruit that I'm over here hoping to give to the Lord one day. As a chaste virgin before the Lord. That's what Paul said to the Corinthian church. I want to offer you up as a chaste virgin before the Lord. That you not have all this other fake Jesus stuff in you. Okay, let's keep going. Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased. Because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned his face and would eat no bread. I do. Like, what a, if you married a man like this, let me just say this. If you married a man like this, you need to pray for that brother. Okay. And, and if you're over there trying to tell this man how to cow eat the cabbage, you need to stop. Because this is a pitiful sight for a man to be curled up in the bed with his face turned towards the wall, not eating bread because he's sad, because he didn't get his way. This is what Jezebel will turn this man into that's supposed to be a king. Spirit of Jezebel will turn him into a little sissy. He's laying in the bed, curled up like in a fetal position. Wah, wah. I can't get my way. 
You don't want to turn your man into that, my friend. I'm not talking to none of y'all. I'm talking to you. You do not want to turn your man into that, my friend. You want a man, right? You want a man that's going to serve the Lord and then take his proper stance in the home. Hallelujah. And to hear from the Lord. Hallelujah. And to love you. But it, oh, okay, let me, let, we're not continuing. <laughs> but Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is your spirit so sad and that you eat no bread? He said unto her, Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it please you, I'll give you another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel's wife said, It's not funny. Lord, forgive me. Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread. Let your heart be merry. I'll give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. He goes, story goes on. She says, make a banquet. Tell Naboth he's the man of honor. As soon as he goes in there, get two people to come in and lie on him. Take him outside and stone him. Boom, done deal. Let his blood hit the ground. Done. Now you get the vineyard of Naboth. Real easy. Now, good news is this. I started this teaching off with the judgment of the great white throne judgment and it just hit me while I was standing here just now after she does that you know what God does he gets Elijah the Tish by thank God for the prophet of God <laughs> he scared yeah he might have ran he might have ran for a little bit but look that brother went and you know, you know what the Lord told Elijah to tell him you go back and you tell Ahab the dogs will lick your blood in the same spot where Naboth's blood was licked up and guess what when they, when they were done with Jezebel they couldn't find nothing but her hands or feet in her head the Lord knows how to bring judgment he's going to do the same thing to that devil when he throws him at the great white throne judgment into the lake of fire one day all his business and all his messing around is going to be judged hallelujah and he's going to end up like Jezebel and Ahab his blood getting licked up by the dogs. But anyway, I wanted to share this with you. Look, we're talking about the reward. I'm almost done. I promise. Look at this. The field of the Lord. You're the field of the Lord. God wants to produce fruit in your life. He wants fruit to come out of your life. Hallelujah. The type and the illustration is Naboth's field is the inheritance of God's people. God has an inheritance for his people. He has a plan to use you. He has a plan to work through you. And he wants to produce fruit through you. And in the end, as you yield your life to him, he's got a reward for you. And if we allow the enemy to have his way, then that's what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. We do not receive the reward that the Lord has for us. Now look at this. You can't make this stuff up. Naboth. Look what his name means. Fruits. Naboth, his name means fruits, and the, he was from Jezreel. Look what that means. Son of God. Fruits, son of God. Go back tonight. Just think about that on your way home. Talk to your spouse about it. Talk to your, your loved ones about it. And, and, and call your friend up on the phone. If you ain't got nobody else to talk to, call me. I'm going to be driving to New Iberia. I'm going to call. call me. Up. Let's talk about this. No, really, think about this. The vineyard of the Lord. The vineyard of the Lord. The fruits of God, fruit sown by God, your fruit sown by God, you're part of the vineyard of the Lord, and the enemy wants to steal the fruit that's been sown by God. You and I as the children of God need to wake up. You and I as the children of God need to understand, no, God's been writing this stuff. God wants to pour out His Spirit. He wants to water the seed. He wants to produce fruit yeah. in our life. I'm going to close with this. Singers, musicians. You can come forward. We're going to close out with a song. If you need prayer, I want you to know the altars are open. Amen. It's not even 12 o'clock yet. Praise God. Feels like I've been preaching for two hours. Hallelujah. Somebody said, feels like you've been preaching for three. <laughs> it's okay. I can feel it. I can feel it, but that's okay. You need to hear it. Because you will not stand at the judgment seat of Christ and say, nobody told you. Right? Amen. Hallelujah. Well, you might, but it won't be true. <laughs> cease not to give thanks for you. This is the Apostle Paul. I cease not to give thanks for you, the church of Ephesus, making mention of you in my prayer. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Boy, that's so powerful. Gosh, we could preach on this for now, right? Easy. Give unto you the spirit of wisdom. Oh, spirit of wisdom. To give us revelation and knowledge regarding God. 
that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. You know, the word in the Greek is photizo, to bring light, because you can't take a picture without light. You can't see. Your eye can't see if, you, if it doesn't have access to light. You have eyes in your understanding. You might not even be able to see physically this morning right now. It doesn't mean that's the end of it right now. Yeah. God's a healer. Amen? Right. But you got spiritual eyes. And even though you may not be able to see as well as you'd like to in the physical right now, he can open up your spiritual eyes. Hallelujah. Yeah. He's a healer. Right. And, and listen, whenever the eyes of your understanding, he wants them to be enlightened. That's Paul's prayer. Why? That you may know the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance is a saint. God has an inheritance for you. He wants you to be a co-heir, a co-ruler and reigner with Christ upon the earth. He wants you to begin to walk in the anointing of what Jesus has paid a high price for you to have. And if you and I will begin to walk in what Christ has done, if you and I will begin to walk in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, guess what? There's a great inheritance. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, Lord, who believe according to the working of his mighty power? Hallelujah. You and I have the opportunity to operate in the power of God. Jesus wants to move through you. Jesus is in you. Jesus lives in you. Hallelujah. The very Christ, the risen Savior lives on the inside of you. I believe you. I've been talking to people. Listen, when we lay hands on somebody, hallelujah, it's like the hand of Jesus. Do we believe it? It's like the hand of Jesus. Help us, Lord. When we pray for people, it's like Jesus is praying for people. He lives in us. Yeah. The Spirit of God wants to flow through us. Oh, let your anointing flow, Lord, which he wrought in Christ. See, without Jesus dying on the cross and raising from the dead, we ain't got nothing. Yeah. But everything goes back to what Jesus did. That's why Paul said this. No other foundation. Go ahead and strum that just. Please. No other foundation. No other foundation can be laid than that which is already laid. Hallelujah, because it was wrought in Christ. It was produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Sat him at the right hand of the Father. I don't know about you, but I'm going to close this service out worshiping the Lord because he's worthy. Yeah. Hallelujah. I want to just.